Welcome to Living Blind. I'm your host, Naomi Hazlitt, and this podcast is brought to you by Balance for Blind Adults, located in Toronto, Canada. This season of Living Blind is sponsored by AMI. Here at Living Blind, we explore the perspectives and lived experiences of people with sight loss and delve into barriers, challenges, and real-life strategies for living life to the fullest. Today's episode is hosted by my colleague and fellow occupational therapist, Eve Hervin. Eve sits down with Canadian lawyer and disability advocate, David Lepofsky, for an interview about disability advocacy, technology, and his career as a lawyer who also happens to be blind. Here's Eve and David. Hi, and welcome to the show today. Thank you so much for coming. It's great to be here. Would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, sure. My name is David Lepofsky. I uh, live in Toronto. I'm totally blind. I'm a uh, youthful 64 years old. I've been, I was born with partial vision in one eye and no vision in the other eye. My good eye started getting worse when I hit 13 or 14. And I was, it gradually got worse and worse so that by the time I was about 21, my vision was totally gone. And I eventually had surgery so that I now have artificial eyes. Um, so I've been living now for uh, two, more than two thirds of my life as a totally blind person. And to put that into perspective for people uh, either newer to vision loss or older to vision loss, um, when my vision was getting, when I first lost the ability to read print unassisted, um, <clears throat> which was around 1972, um, we had just moved from real to real tape recorders for audiobooks to cassette tape, but cassette recorders were big, heavy things, or, or some of them were getting lighter, but it wasn't until about 1980 until the Walkman came along, which was a cassette recorder that could fit in your pocket um, and wouldn't be luggable. Um, and my first experience with a talking computer was 1983. So it's almost 40 years ago. You've really seen technology, I imagine, technology change and develop. Absolutely. The way I would put it is... Um, we, we, we hear of those whose uh, great grandparents told their parents uh, or whatever <clears throat> that they remember before there was the motor vehicle mm -hmm. or, <coughs> excuse me, before there was the, the aeroplane to travel. So before there was a plane, if you were going to go from Toronto to Florida, you know, you had to plan for a five or six day uh, trip uh, or possibly shorter, but it's a long train trip. Of course, before that, if you're on a horse, it would be weeks and weeks. Um, along comes the airplane and you can fly to Florida for a meeting, turn around and come back the same day. Um, that's the transition I've seen. I mean, I, when I was um, in uh, law school, which was 76 to 79, or I was in undergrad, which I did only two years at York from 74 to 76, I had two volunteer readers who uh, came to the house um, once a week. I lived with my parents. They were recruited by CNIB. They were lovely people. I think at one point I had three, but they would each do two hours of reading. So uh, two hours of reading is about uh, 50 pages, 25 pages an hour. So two people, four hours, that's uh, 100 hours, or 100 pages a week of discretionary reading. That would be for papers or essays I was writing. Uh, what that meant was I had to be pretty brutal in prioritizing what I had to read. Um, a new book that came out that would be of interest to me, like forget it. You'd send it to the CNIB Talking Book Library and maybe get it available in a couple of years um, because of their backlog. Um, now, fast forward, you know, I now carry an iPhone <clears throat> where I can uh, use an app like uh, Seeing AI or one of the pay apps, take a picture of a piece of paper and it's 10 seconds later, it's reading to me. 
Um, I remember when I did my master's of law at Harvard, which was <clears throat> 81 to 82, um, the Kurzweil reading machine had just come out. Now, those who know the app KNFB Reader um, know the K stands for Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil was the inventor of the modern technology we use, optical character recognition and speech synthesis and putting them together in a device. I sat down at the offices down the street from where I lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts of, of Kurzweil reading machines. I sat at my first reading machine, put a book on it, pushed a button and waited a minute while it scanned the page and then uh, read me the page. And then I'd turn the page in the book, put it down, press the button again, it would scan the second page and read the next page aloud. This to me was almost like a religious experience. It was unbelievable it could do this. That machine cost $50,000 US. Wow. Uh, I, I did not buy one. Now, 50,000 US in 1982 is probably, I'm going to guess, 150,000 or 200,000 Canadian in the year 2021. You can now get that, uh, well, the KNFB Reader app, when I got it, was considered very expensive at 100 bucks. It went down to 50 bucks. Uh, but now you get seeing AI for free. Uh, that was a two hundred thousand dollar machine. So yes, the the world for me has gone from having to brutally choose what hundred pages I would read per year uh, to literally being able to take a picture of a page, read it any time, go online, find endless tons of information, talking books that are now called audiobooks that you can download and put onto your player and not have to wait for them to come back to a, a library, <coughs> excuse me, from a prior, um, a prior reader, uh, come to your house, put the tape in your tape player and find out the tape crinkled and you can't read. Uh, you can't read it. You got to set it back to get fixed. It's a very different place. Yeah, that's quite remarkable, all the change and everything that's happened. So just going off of that, I know you spoke about um, you did your master's of law at Harvard and your 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 law training. When you were working as a lawyer, um, how how did you adapt that to vision loss? Your, working as a lawyer. Well, it uh, I practiced law from 1982 when I started with the government of Ontario till the end of uh, 2015 when I retired. <clears throat> I now teach part time uh, at a law at Osgoode Hall Law School and at U of T. Uh, faculty of law and I do my volunteer advocacy the rest of the time but I saw uh, how I practiced was evolving over the 33 years that I worked so when I started I did not have a talking computer uh, they weren't out yet or at least not available <clears throat> so I was using a typewriter and uh, I had a sighted assistant uh, full-time secretary most other lawyers got like a third of a secretary, I had a full-time secretary who would read things aloud to me, read back things I typed, uh, record uh, key documents for cases on audio cassettes and then braille label them using a Dymo label maker. Um, <clears throat> and I had to um, uh, use that as my, my method uh, of work. Um, starting in uh, uh, June of 1983, I got my first talking computer. Um, it was extremely expensive by modern standards. It was 16,000 bucks. It had a huge, ginormous five megabyte hard drive. Um, and But it was the first time I could keyboard and then read back what I was writing and edit it. Obviously, um, computers have evolved a great deal. Um, a couple of the major milestones in my life was, oh, I guess 2000, probably 1985-86, when I reached in my own pocket and bought myself a, an IBM PC for home. It was way cheaper. It was only, I think, 3000 bucks with the screen reader built in. Um, and I did that because I otherwise I had to go to the office to work. So if I had to work on a case that was over the weekend or work late into the night, I had to be at my office and I wanted to be able to go home, have dinner um, uh, or get up early on a Saturday morning, work for a few hours, then maybe go out with friends 
without having to schlep down to my office. This was a revolution for me being able me to be able to work at home. Um, when we moved to the, I guess the early '90s, when I got my first laptop computer, that was the next revolution because it meant I could take my uh, my work anywhere. I could go to court and have all my notes and all the cases that I've got electronically. I could take all of the uh, my work loaded onto my computer and be sitting in a courtroom. And what, this was significant not only for working on a case while my case was being heard, but it was also significant because you didn't just show up to court and they start listening to you. Typically, you'd be on a case list and you'd have to sometimes sit in court all day while other cases are being argued. Well, up until then, I just had to sit there and do nothing. Uh, my sighted colleagues could sit there and be reading their notes in preparation for the case, but I couldn't do anything. Well, once I had a laptop with my materials on them, I could then put in earphones. And I could work in the courtroom too. I could work in an airplane. I could work anywhere. The idea of now being able to carry all my knowledge with me was um, extraordinary. Um, the early 90s, when I got my first document scanner, that was a huge revolution. And on and on it goes. Now, in terms of how... Um, and I retired before the iPhone became like a critical tool in my work. I already had one, but it was uh, nowhere near the tool that it is now. What I'll tell you is I evolved how I adapted to my work for or two reasons over time. One was uh, because of new technology. Um, and the other was experimenting with new ways of doing things. So let me give you an example. You go to court. Um, I initially would braille my notes in advance of the case. Um, I just sit here the night before, uh, I have my computer with all my plan for my oral argument and spend two hours transcribing notes into braille. Now my braille skills are not good because I lost my reading vision in my teens. And so I never acquired the <clears throat> ability to read extensively in braille um, or quickly. So this was a, a burden. I create all of these notes, and sometimes I wouldn't use any of them. And then eventually I decided, you know what, skip the braille. And I would write notes in, um, in uh, Microsoft Word, and I'd get up on the podium when it was time to speak, and I'd put an earphone in one ear, and I'd have a finger on the down arrow key so I could have the computer reading me my notes if I needed them, uh, and so on. And I would scroll through that way. But that I was constantly, up until the day I retired, I was constantly experimenting with new ways of trying out to do things and figuring out what worked. But the one thing that always worked best, I always found, was I made sure when I went to court, I wanted to be the one in the courtroom who knew the case the best, mm -hmm. who knew the materials, knew the transcripts I was, if it was an appeal, knew the, um, the witness statements, the case law, whatever. Uh, because once you get to court, no matter how many much planning you do and how many notes you have, things never turn out like you'd expect. It's nothing like TV. New issues pop up you didn't expect. The other side makes an argument you didn't expect. The judges go off on some tangent you didn't expect. So I, my best resource was knowing the material as well as I could, so being able to extemporaneously respond. And what kind of law do you practice, or sorry, did you practice? Well, I, I was always working for the provincial government, the Ministry of the Attorney General. For my first five years, I was in the Crown Law Civil, <coughs> Crown Law Office Civil, doing civil litigation for the government. The government's the biggest party being sued or suing in the province. Uh, I then switched to constitutional law branch, and for five years, all I did was uh, constitutional law cases when the government was being sued under the Charter of Rights or whatever, our office uh, represented the government. Um, and then starting in 1993, after 10 years, I switched for my last job, <clears throat> which I stayed in for the last 23 years. I was in the Crown Office Criminal. We are the office that do um, all the criminal appeals to the Court of Appeal in the Supreme Court of Canada. So if a person gets convicted of a crime, uh, and sentenced, and they want to appeal to the court appeal or the Supreme Court, either saying I shouldn't have been convicted, or I got too high a sentence, uh, we would appear on the Crown side. So I did a lot of homicides, um, a lot of robberies, uh, sex offenses, like the standard unfortunate diet of awful things that people do out there 
Um, I was involved. I was in an office of over 70 lawyers. We all were doing the same thing because we were doing these cases for the entire province. Wow, that's that's such an impressive law career. That's amazing. So switching gears a bit from your law career to now your work around an advocate. And I just know from knowing about you through my previous degree that you do a lot with the AODA. Um, would you like to talk about, could you please talk about that and your work as an advocate? Sure. Um, I want to just explain because if anybody's listening, right. they may feel it's like if they've got <clears throat> a legal problem that they might want to come to me to represent them. I'm actually not in private law practice. Um, I cannot give legal advice to clients. I can't represent people. I can't do it informally. I can't do it for free. I just can't do it. So um, when people sometimes hear of me and they hear I'm a lawyer and they've got an issue, they call up and say, you know, what are my rights? What should I do? And I have to say, you know, go to the Arch Disability Law Center. They do amazing work. Uh, that's where you should go. Um, I've been involved for since, on and off, since I guess the late 70s or early 80s as a volunteer doing advocacy for new laws. So starting in um, uh, around 1979, 1980, there was a movement in Ontario to get disability added to the Ontario Human Rights Code. The Ontario Human Rights Code banned discrimination in areas like housing and employment uh, and goods and services, but it didn't ban discrimination based on disability. So I worked with a number of other people in an advocacy effort to get the law amended. In uh, 1980, over 40 years ago, um, our then prime minister, a guy named Trudeau, uh, Pierre Trudeau proposed a new constitution with a charter of rights. It was gonna include an equality rights section, section 15, but that section did not include equality for people with disabilities. I and others thought that was a bad idea. So a number of us advocated to get the charter amended to include equality for people with disabilities before parliament passed it. And we were successful. It was a group effort. You can go on YouTube now, if you search, you'll see the presentation I made to the House of Commons Standing Committee back then, but I was one of many who advocated on this. I wasn't the lead person or a lead person. Um, and, uh, but we won that. There's also a lecture I gave at, at my law school at Utah, on YouTube um, where I tell the whole story that led to that. Um, if you go to YouTube and you search on David Lepofsky, L-E-P-O-F-S-K-Y and Charter of Rights, you'll, uh, you'll find that. The uh, Starting in the mid 90s, a number of us started to feel that the guarantees in the Charter of Rights in the Human Rights Code for us were good, but weren't getting us where we should go. So we started advocating for a new law and I ended up leading the campaign for that, a volunteer campaign working with lots of disability organizations, lots of individuals who together fought for a decade and in 2005, the Ontario legislature passed the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, or AODA. I now lead the volunteer AODA Alliance, which campaigns to get it effectively enacted. We don't represent individual people in cases. We advocate for getting the government to effectively implement it. If people listening to us want to learn more about this, let me offer you a couple of tips. Uh, one is to sign up to get our our email updates. I write those updates as chair of the AODA Alliance, and they let you know what's going on, how you can help our campaign. Uh, and there's no membership fee or anything like that. This is all free and volunteer. Go to aodaalliance.org. That's www.aodaalliance.org. And on our homepage, there's a link for signing up. And you just paste in your email address, sign up, you get our updates. The other thing is we're very active on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, go to at AODA Alliance, follow at AODA Alliance, and you'll see what we're up to and you can retweet our tweets. The most important thing I've learned doing this advocacy um, are really, well, there's really two things. First, make your case persuasive. When I'm talking to reporters, when I'm talking to government people, when I'm talking to disability organizations or town halls, 
if we can't persuade ourselves, we're never going to persuade anybody else. We got to have a good, strong case. You got to have a reasonable case, but an ambitious case. And we're always doing that. And the second thing is um, our biggest strength uh, are those of you who are listening to this podcast. When people feel they can't make a difference, and so don't even try, then we lose. I'm going to give you an example. In Toronto, um, the city council was considering um, uh, allowing electric scooters. In fact, having the city rent them out to people. These are really dangerous. For These are not scooters for people with disabilities. These are ones where you stand up and, and you could go whipping at 24 kilometers an hour. Um, and they present a real danger wherever they've been allowed to the public and especially to people with disabilities, seniors and kids. Well, the case, the, those who were fighting for these were corporate lobbyists for the e-scooter rental companies who are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And they were putting on an unbelievable feeding frenzy, like a, literally an orgy of corporate lobby at City Hall. It did not look like we were going to be able to keep them out, but it was because of uh, disability organizations and individuals with disabilities calling their city councilors, um, logging on to city council meetings and making presentations, just saying, not in my city. We want it, and we want it unanimously. City council voted unanimously to say no to the corporate lobbyists. We're now taking this fight to other cities. London, Ontario is considering them. Hamilton, Ontario is considering them. Ottawa has already allowed them, but we're going to try to get that stopped. Windsor has allowed them. We're going to try to get that stopped. But the, our grassroots, our best strength are people like you who are listening to this, who decide, I want to get active. I want to help. Uh, you don't need to have any training. You don't need to have any background. Sign up for our updates and we'll show you how to do it. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing all that. I'm sure our listeners will be very interested in knowing how to get in contact and getting more information on that. Um, so another thing I wanted to ask you about was I know you mentioned that you use your iPhone a lot currently. Are there any other tips or tricks that you'd like to discuss that have helped you just in everyday life with vision loss? Um, I, I find that we are constantly getting new opportunities to do things differently. The overall way we are in terms of human nature is you just want to do everything the same. You know, that's the way we are. You don't, you just want to get up and get into your routine. But for us, uh, as people with vision loss or other people with disabilities, um, we benefit by constantly looking for something new. When I travel back when we were able to travel, uh, before this nightmare of COVID. Um, I like to go to blindness agencies in different cities around the US, for example, and go into their tech aid store. Because yeah, they all had the same white canes and they all have the same damn Scrabble set and playing cards and talking watches. But <clears throat> there were times where the people running those stores uh, went to local stores, not looking for products designed for people with vision loss, but for mainstream products that just turn out to be really good for us. And uh, there are times they find things that, like for the kitchen or whatever that were, uh, were really helpful. I'm going to give you an example. Um, Bose, the music company that makes earphones and headphones, they invented this thing a couple of years ago, probably three years ago, called the Bose Frames, Bose's B-O-S-E Frames. And they're, they're sunglasses. Now, I don't need sunglasses. I can't see a damn thing. But what they are is they're a Bluetooth headset. And I uh, connect them to my iPhone, uh, which is really easy. And when I go for a walk now, I can listen to a podcast, I can make phone calls, or... I can have my, one of my talking GPS apps tell me where I am. And so if I just go for a stroll and I make a wrong turn, I don't care because I can use the GPS app to know exactly where I am and find my way back. And what's great about the Bose frames is they're lightweight and they don't cover your ears. 
and and we blind folks need to have our ears wide open <clears throat> so that we can um, use uh, echolocation, we can respond to what's around us. I would never use my AirPods while I'm walking because they block your hearing. And if you click on their transparency mode, so it lets in outside sound. Yeah, it lets in outside sound, but it, it kind of sounds like you're listening through an amplifier. It doesn't sound natural. But the Bose frames, which were a couple hundred bucks when I got them, man, I'm using them every day. Uh, they make a huge difference. So sometimes it's a product that wasn't designed for us, uh, but which uh, is really useful for us that can be uh, amazingly helpful and make something like the iPhone, which is really useful, uh, even better. The other thing I'm going to recommend is there are uh, a number of really good podcasts from folks around the world who are visually impaired folks talking about the latest tech. It may be about the latest version of iOS or the latest iPhone or the latest app. Um, I really recommend them. David Woodbridge down in um, Australia does incredibly useful um, uh, podcasts uh, on uh, where he explains the latest uh, uh, Apple applications and how to use them. Um, Jonathan Mosen, uh, in uh, in Welland, pardon me, Wellington, uh, New Zealand, talks about a lot of the latest stuff. There are excellent podcasts um, uh, that are worth listening to. Sometimes people just talk and talk and talk, and there's a bit too much joking around. I'd rather they get to the point. But listen, we're honored that they volunteer their time to put these together. I, I, I tease the people who run these podcasts that they cost me a lot of money because I often hear about some new gadget like the Bose frames that I normally would never have heard about uh, and that make a huge difference in my life. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, to Just to confirm about the Bose headphones, those are the ones that use bone conduction, correct? No, it is not bone conduction. It's not. Um, I got the aftershocks, which are the bone conduction ones. And I know a lot of people use them and love them. And that's another example of a mainstream product that was designed for the mainstream, but which had a huge benefit for us. Um, the reason I didn't like them is because they don't cover your ear, but the, uh, the pad sits right beside your ear. And I found it was affecting some of the airflow and it was uh, affecting some of my echolocation. Now, I don't use echolocation by clicking my tongue or whatever, but I just... Walking down the street, I'm using a lot of sound to know where I am. And if my cane is clicking on the ground, it's creating a soundscape for me. The Bose frames are just, a, they look like a pair of cheap sunglasses that you bought at the counter at the grocery store. They're very lightweight. Um, um, and they uh, don't cover your ears at all. They don't cover your face at all. Oh, I see. Thank you so much for clarifying. And thank you for your time. Listen, thanks so much for doing this and thanks for doing this podcast. It's great that you make this available. Stay safe. You too. And now a message from our sponsor. Discover AMI's collection of podcasts created by and for the blind and partially sighted community. Visit ami.ca to learn more. AMI entertains, informs, and empowers. Hi everyone, it's me, Deborah Gold, Executive Director of Balance for Blind Adults. I wanted to let you know about our Because of Balance campaign that's running now until November 9th, 2021. It's a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser where our clients get to share their story of how Balance has helped them. The campaign helps support all of our programs and services outside of our core funding. As you can imagine, COVID-19 has had an impact on the types of services we can offer, but that has not stopped us from providing a diverse group of programs virtually. Activities like our Coffee Connections group, our Trivia Nights, and even this podcast. Visit the Because of Balance link in the show notes to hear stories, watch videos, and to make a contribution to one of our fantastic storytellers. On behalf of our clients, thank you so much. And now, back to the podcast. 
I wanted to congratulate you, uh, Eve. You recently took on the position of occupational therapist at Balance for Blind Adults, uh, and you were a student over the summer. So welcome to the team. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's very exciting. And I'm glad I had such a great experience as a student and they decided to, to keep me around. So I'm definitely looking forward to it. For sure. So you interviewed David Lepofsky over the summer as part of your student experience. And uh, I wanted to first say that when I listened to the episode, it was such a great interview. And one thing that really stood out to me at the time was that I think that I went into the interview expecting you to, or David, to talk a lot about being a lawyer and an advocate. So were you surprised that the conversation focused so much on technology or did you have any other thoughts about how the interview went? I was surprised. I have had the opportunity to hear David speak previously and they were in the context of my education. So he talked in my disability law class a lot about the AODA and as well, I heard him speak in a critical disability class about his experience and advocacy. So hearing this conversation focus more on technology was definitely uh, was definitely surprising and as well was really interesting. It was really interesting to hear all his thoughts and he definitely knew a lot and has experienced a lot. And just on a personal note, David is someone that I've quoted in my papers in school and that I've read his work and I've he- heard him speak in my education. So getting this chance to talk to him in this context was super exciting. I'm really happy to hear that. It, it kind of came all full circle for you in a way. It definitely did. It was a nice way to kind of round out the end of my educational journey for sure. Mm-hmm. So Eve, you and I are both occupational therapists and I know that David didn't mention occupational therapy as part of his approach or his journey, but I think you and I clearly have a lot to learn from him. So in your role as an OT, are there any takeaways that you have brought forward with you from your conversation with him? Mm -hmm. Just about how much assistive technology has changed and how much it has advanced. Like David was speaking about how initially he would have volunteers from the CNIB come to his home and read to him and for a certain limited amount of time. And now he can use his iPhone just to scan and have anything read back to him. So I think it's really interesting about how much technology can support our clients in engaging in occupation and even things like reading. He said he used to have to send a book away and wait months for it to come back. But now you can listen to a book on Audible or you can have your iPhone scan the book. So it really gives you the opportunity to engage in whatever it is that's that's meaningful to you. For sure, technology has definitely helped a lot. Yeah, I remember one part of the interview that I was really shocked was hearing how expensive the Kurtzwell reader was. I think it was about $150,000 more or less in today's currency. And I was just thinking, um, you know, given that price tag or some of the pieces that you mentioned or he mentioned about not having access to an iPhone until he retired, it really made me respect David for all of the barriers that he had to you know, break down or work with along his journey. It was really impressive to me. And um, it just goes to show how great uh, a person he is, a great a lawyer and an advocate he is as well. Yeah, I agree. It's it's certainly almost even more impressive that he's had such a career he's had because he didn't have the use of all the modern technology that we have today. Mm -hmm. So I guess in terms of wrapping up our conversation, um, is there anything else or any other thoughts that you had about your interview, your conversation with David that we didn't cover today that you think would be important for people to know? Yes, when I was listening back to this conversation and just reflecting about all the advances in technology, I also, it made me think about some of the clients I have who don't have a smartphone or just don't want to use a smartphone, aren't comfortable with a smartphone. You know, some of our clients, such as older adults, also don't use a computer. And while I think it's definitely important as OTs that we support our clients in using those and training them, if that's something that they wish to do, It's also totally okay if you're not comfortable with it. So there is still, I feel, a space for kind of that more old school technology, such as a tape player, which David did mention 
in it or a Walkman. And that's okay too. You know, as, as great as technology is, not everyone is comfortable with it. And as OTs, we need to be able to support all our clients, those who are more comfortable, those who want to learn and those who don't. Mm-hmm. I think that's well said. I think that especially if you're not familiar with technology, it might be easy just to say, well, the iPhone is amazing. It will do everything you want to do, but having options, I think was the takeaway. I mean, David even mentioned it himself in that, you know, he doesn't like phone conducting headphones, but other people with visual impairments do. So I think that's a great takeaway in terms of let's give clients that's enable choice among our clients in terms of how they're going to engage in their career and their life or just taking a walk down the street. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I really like how you said enabling choice and as well, just it's up to the individual. People are different and the kinds of equipment that they will use that they will like will be different for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks again for taking the time to record an interview for the show and all the best in your career. Thank you so much. That's it for this episode. Thanks for tuning in. We hope that you enjoyed it as much as we enjoy doing the show. Special thanks to today's guest, executive producer Deborah Gold, and the entire team at Balance for Blind Adults. If you like what you heard today, feel free to subscribe, like, or follow us on whatever platform you're listening on. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Balance for Blind Adults. For more information about Balance, our programs and services, and to access the show notes, please visit us at www.balancefba.org. I'm producer Troy Taylor, and this has been Living Blind. Thanks for listening.